Welcome back, everybody. So we've been having an incredibly uh, informative, thought-provoking, debate-filled day today. Um, a lot of people describe events at MIT like drinking from a fire hose, and that's exactly what I'm experiencing. I'm learning a ton. Uh, I hope you're learning and enjoying it as well. Welcome to the last panel, which is about speech, restoring speech. So free speech is a cornerstone of our democracy, the marketplace of ideas, but most would agree that some form of harmful speech has to be moderated. Um, so really in this panel, we wanna think about how do we draw the lines between free and harmful speech in the age of social media and who gets to draw those lines? We've got a, an amazing panel uh, to help us with this. Um, Renee DeResta from the Stanford Internet Observatory, Yael Eisenstadt uh, from the Future of Democracy, a fellow there, um, the Berggren Institute and uh, researcher in residence at Beta Lab, uh, Jeff Kossoff, assistant professor at the US Naval Academy and Rick Stengel, former Under Secretary of State for Public Affairs and Diplomacy and former managing editor of Time Magazine. So let me sort of frame the conversation for us and then, and then get right to our panelists. Just to remind everybody, the purpose of this summit is to talk about solutions, not do hand-wringing about the problems. We've been talking a lot about the problems. I wanna talk about the solutions. What can we concretely do to fix the social media crises that we find ourselves in? So for the purposes of this panel, it's about speech. This is potentially one of the most difficult, nuanced, tricky, uh, hot button, third rail sort of issues that we have in this social media debate. Now, I'm a big supporter of the First Amendment as a cornerstone of democracy. I'm a big believer in the marketplace of ideas as a wellspring of innovation, but I also know uh, that I can give you existence proofs of the need for a line between free speech and harmful speech, right? You can't yell fire in a crowded theater. That's a very common uh, you know, example that people give. Sometimes the First Amendment uh, protection of free speech contravenes the 14th Amendment protection uh, of equal protection under the law. And I'm fairly sure most people would agree that we don't want live streaming of mass murders like the one we saw in Christchurch, New Zealand, uh, happening freely over Facebook. So while speech is essential, we also need a healthy dose of moderation and we need to draw lines between free and harmful speech. But the, quest the question is, how do we draw those lines? Who, who gets to draw those lines and where should they be drawn? So today we're gonna to explore the directions that law and platform policy can take, should take to restore speech while minimizing its harmful effects. And Jeff, I wanna start with you because you essentially wrote the book on section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. I'm talking about the book, uh, the 26 words that created the internet, uh, which is, you know, the, the, the section 230 is now at the heart of this discussion about how we regulate and manage speech. It's one of the most important parts of that discussion that we see today. You know, some people argue 230 allows platforms to host harmful content with impunity. And then other people say, wait a minute, it allows platforms to disproportionately moderate and therefore suppress conservative speech. So give us a little bit of a history lesson and a little bit of sort of, you know, what section 230 is all about. Uh, why was it written originally and what does it do today? Sure, well, thanks so much for having me. And I have to give a quick disclaimer that I'm only speaking on my own behalf, not on behalf of the Naval Academy, DOD or Department of Navy. Um, and so now to get right into why Section 230 was written, sort of the high level overview is it goes back well before the internet. It goes back to what is the liability of companies or individuals that distribute speech that others have created. And this is something that goes back to bookstores and newsstands where a case uh, that started at the Supreme Court, but then lower courts kind of uh, embellished upon it, uh, they essentially said that a newsstand, a magazine store is only liable for either defamatory or obscene material that it sells if it knows or has reason to know of the uh, defamatory content or illegal content. So that worked pretty well throughout the 1970s and 80s in a handful of cases involving magazines and bookstores. Um, 
The problem came in the early 90s, and you have these uh, services that now I feel really old because my students have no idea what I'm talking about when I talk about Prodigy and CompuServe. Um, so these are services that had very different policies. Uh, CompuServe was very much uh, Wild West. Like they, they did little moderation. They did some, but not all that much. Um, and they let people and third parties post whatever they wanted. And uh, Prodigy wanted to be family friendly. So they had much more extensive user content policies and they had a lot of moderators. Uh, both of the services, not surprisingly in the early 1990s get sued for defamation based on third party content. Uh, CompuServe is able to get the case dismissed because it's found to be like a newsstand uh, and it had no reason to know of the defamatory content. Uh, Prodigy, on the other hand, is found to be a publisher and not a distributor. And what the judge says in 1995 is because Prodigy moderated, it faces the same liability as the person who wrote the comments. So just, to, just to break in, it's the act of moderation that made them liable in that Exactly. That's exactly right. Editorial control is how the judge put it. And um, this caught the attention, th this got a lot of media attention because it created this perverse incentive to take a hands off approach if you're an online service. So you would face less potential for liability. So that's where Congress stepped in. And uh, in their 1996 overhaul of the telecommunications laws, they, uh, they included to very little fanfare or attention, Section 230, which was written by uh, Republican Chris Cox and Democrat Ron Wyden, which says that if you're the provider of an interactive computer service, uh, you are not treated as the publisher or speaker of information provided by another information content provider. So what that means is that if you uh, have not taken a role in creating the content, you are not going to face liability, or that's effectively how the courts interpreted it within a year or so of its passage. And so that has created very broad protections. Uh, there are some exceptions for intellectual property law and uh, federal criminal law, but overall it has really allowed companies to determine how to moderate uh, and how to structure their services and to base their services around user content without fearing liability. So this isn't just about Facebook, right? It's about the commenting section of the New York Times. It's about all of Wikipedia, am I correct? Absolutely. I mean, it's hard to imagine how Wikipedia could exist. It's hard to imagine how Yelp could at least exist with its current policies of not taking sides in factual disputes. Um, so, so yeah, absolutely. It's not just, obviously Facebook and Twitter and YouTube, they all benefit uh, quite a bit from 230, but it's the, a community news blog that allows user comments. Uh, it's uh, all sorts of hobbyist blogs. It's anything that allows other people to post on its platform. What would happen if we just repealed Section 230 wholesale with no replacement and no reform? Well, so it's hard to know for certain because we don't know how now, uh, more than 25 years after 230's passage, exactly how courts would apply those magazine distributor standards to modern social media. So I think it would have to work through the courts a little bit. Um, I would say in the meantime, while the courts are determining those standards, um, my best guess, and this is having been a lawyer who advised companies that have websites that post user content, is lawyers are risk averse. And if you increase the potential for liability, that's going to cause platforms to be much more cautious and be more likely to err on the side of taking down material after you get a complaint or material that might be controversial. So uh, just kind of if, if the lawyers have their say, at least, uh, I, I think that will uh, cause more material to be taken down than, other, than would otherwise be under Section 230. So if we think about reform instead of repeal, there have been a ton of different proposals, a lot of them. Uh, very recently, for example, some have proposed immunity certifications be contingent on FTC audits of political neutrality. That's Hawley's bill. Others have proposed carve outs for specific types of speech like child sex abuse. That's the Earn It Act or, you know, others still want to define the standards of good faith in, in Section C2, the Rubio Good Samaritans Act or remove the otherwise objectionable clause from the list of reasons under which the companies can remove or restrict access to content. That's the Protect Speech Act. So 
what is the right approach if we're thinking not repeal, but reform? Like, what do you think is the best set of reforms that would ameliorate some of the problems we see, but not cause more problems? So I talk with everyone who wants to talk about Section 230 with me. This is my third Section 230 panel of the day. Um, so I, I talk with members and their staffers, members of Congress uh, from all sides. And I will say that in these past two years of having a lot of conversations, I think that the before we figure out what the solution is, I think settling more on what the problem is, is really key because I, I mean, I, I can talk with one congressional staffer who thinks the problem is that there's too much harmful content online. And that's where I, I personally think that's the biggest problem right now. But I can talk to another congressional staffer who says that they believe that certain groups and people are being unfairly, having their viewpoints unfairly blocked by these massive companies. And I mean, that that's a legitimate concern, obviously. And I, I think that the solutions that are being proposed to address both of those problems oftentimes conflict. And I think we have not really settled on what, what the problem is right now. And we also need uh, better dialogue. And I think, I think conferences like this are a really great start um, to talk about what the sort of logistical, technical realities and frankly, human resource realities are of moderation. And I, I think before, I, I, I think we're not far enough along in that conversation yet to actually settle on a solution. I think we have to do a better job identifying the problem. So Yael, I wanna, I wanna turn to you uh, because you used to lead uh, Facebook's election integrity operations for political advertising before you left that job. But you were also, you also worked a lot on democracy and security issues as a CIA officer, as a White House advisor. So I wanna talk to you about a specific dimension of difficulty in speech and harmful speech, which is the, the distinction or the, or the line between the enactment of democracy and the preservation of democracy. Uh, this is about elections integrity or speech that sort of threatens democracy in and of itself. So just like in the last nine months, we've seen a foiled plot to kidnap and kill the governor of Michigan uh, plotted over Facebook. We've seen uh, the Capitol riot mobilized in part over social media. We've seen anti-vaccine protests coordinated uh, over social media that shut down one of the largest vaccine centers in America at Dodger Stadium, uh, propagated uh, over social media. So how can we think about drawing the lines uh, between free and harmful speech when it comes to the balance between expressing political opinions uh, you know, in an expression of democratic engagement, no matter how strong or from what side they come on one hand, and then engaging in speech that threatens uh, our political institutions, that, uh, that threatens our democratic processes like voting, or, you know, that's at the very heart of our republic. Like, how do we think about that line drawing process? I think I'm gonna start by giving you the most unsatisfying answer to this question which is that I can't actually give you the precise line of where speech crosses into illegal, right? This is something our courts and legal scholars have debated for decades, if, if not centuries. And, and that actual precise question, I suspect will continue to be debated. And, and I know this panel in particular is about speech. I think though a little level setting is to really understand the difference between what is speech and what is the way a social media company handles that speech, what their tools are with what they do with that speech. But I'll get to that, I'm sure, as we go on. Um, but to your question about speech and democracy, um, it's funny, I always, like people love to have a quick hot take about your comments. I mean, I swore an oath to the constitution to protect, to, to protect our constitution. So clearly free speech is, sacrosanct for the United States. But I know a lot of people want to talk about content moderation, which is really difficult and really hard. That's about what to take down and what to leave up. It's important. But the bigger issue is really about the tools that the platform companies are using to decide what to do with this speech, as well as the intentional business decisions that these platforms make on what to enforce, when to enforce their policies. So just 
to level set, unfortunately, so much of the conversation focuses on speech. And I think in a way that is part of the reason we aren't getting to the solutions phase yet, because to Jeff's point, like there's different ways to define the problem. I do not define the problem in terms of what speech an individual says. Let's, let's look at the examples that you mentioned in your question, right? You brought up the Governor Whitmer um, kidnapping that was being planned uh, January 6th. So here's what's interesting. In none of those cases, none of them was it purely about speech. It was about planning attacks. It was about connecting with other potential insurrectionists, or it was about conspiracy theories and lies being constantly amplified and curated into your feeds. It was about people who then met in groups, possibly connected or recommended by Facebook's own algorithms, and then plotting out these, these crimes. None of that is about just speech. Right. So, I mean, I definitely don't want to take credit for Renee's and Azaraskin's comment about free speech and free reach are not the same thing, but this is sort of the core here, right? You have a situation where you have these platforms who really, especially Facebook, I mean, it's not just because I worked there, but they are the biggest in this space and the most powerful who love to make sure we keep talking about this as a free speech versus censorship problem because that benefits them, right? Then they don't really have to discuss the harder issues, which are, in any one of these cases, let's look at January 6th. What I would love to see is any one of the people who've been indicted, any one of the people that were indicted so far in the insurrection at the Capitol, did they just go on to Twitter or Facebook and search for Stop the Steal? Or did they go onto these platforms and search for QAnon? Did they go look for these groups? Or did a recommendation pop up and say, we see that you like, I mean, it's targeting a lot of different communities like the wellness community or veterans. We see that you're a veteran. Maybe you might be interested in this group. And did the recommendation engine start taking any of these people further and further down, whether it's a QAnon conspiracy path or whether it was to stop the steal path? And I, I mean, obviously Jeff is way smarter on Section 230 than I am. But what I'm concerned about, the reason we'll never know the answer to that, yeah, it's possible Facebook is not complicit as much as I believe they are in what happened on January 6th. But what I'm afraid of is the reason we'll never know is because if somebody were to try to take them to court, let's say a family member of one of the people, I don't know, a family member of one of the officers who was killed or somebody was to try to take Facebook to court to say, you actually are complicit in allowing these people to plan it on your platform or recommending these people into these groups, I suspect Facebook will try to use the Section 230 argument to say, we're not responsible for the speech that these conspiracy theorists are posting. But well, can we get to the point where we actually have to get to discovery to see, yes, but did your recommendation engines, your targeting tools, your, your curation, did it do any of these things that actually helped facilitate this crime? So I know that's complicated. Um, I have so much more I think about, I, I wanna say about this, but I'm gonna try not to have a 40 minute answer. <laughs> I know it's hard. I, I, if I were on these panels, I would also uh, want to have a 40 minute answer. But I, I, I hear you about the speech versus reach. And I am going to go to Renee for that since uh, as an origin of that uh, sort of phrase um, several years ago now, if I come to think about it. And by the way, what I'm noticing as I do these panels is the, is the interrelatedness of all of the topics. So we had a panel on transparency and how much we need to go under the hood of the algorithms to understand what effects that they have in order to understand, well, is that really you know, a driver of um, you know, uh, some of the outcomes that we see? Um, but this notion also of social proof, right? Because sure, the act of, if I were to, to, to just separate the coordination of the plot to kidnap and kill the go governor of Michigan, uh, the communications that happened over the phone versus the communications that happened over Facebook or the Capitol riot, there are differences, right? And it's not just 100%. the algorithms. That's exactly what you're saying, right? Right. And the difference is, 
is not just the algorithmic out amplification of certain types of content, but this notion of social proof, legitimizing and mobilizing crowds in a way that one-to-one uh, -one phone communications can't do without the many-to-many -many community aspect of social media uh, that exists. So I guess my question to you is, you know, but, but the speech acts are essential in the coordination, mobilization, legitimization of the outcomes that we see, you know, is there, you know, are there important legal or platform policies at our disposal to think about uh, the preservation of democracy as it relates to mobilization and legitimization through social proof or the many to manyness of the communication or the, amp uh, the algorithmic amplification uh, or recommendations that send you to certain groups and so on. So again, this is where I go back to the idea of none of us here can say definitively whether or not Facebook or Twitter are actually guilty of some crime in any of these things because we can't even get to the point of having that day in court, right? So that's one of the problems. And when I was at Facebook, I find that actually cre created a really perverse incentive, right? Two of the big things I tried to do when I was there um, was one, the first thing I challenged early on in 2018 is why aren't we fact-checking political ads? Not because I think we should be the arbiters of truth, but we're taking money for political ads. No, they're not actually as impactful as organic content, most likely, but still, we're taking money for them. We're putting these little labels on them saying this ad is paid for by making it already seem like it's somehow more credible or so or or that we've done some sort of verification there. And we're letting the advertiser use all sorts of sophisticated targeting tools to decide who gets to see that speech, to actually decide if you and I will see the same version of that ad and the cornerstone of a democracy is that we don't need to agree. And by the way, I have never, ever advocated, I've never advocated that they stop political ads. I've never advocated that, they, that we scrap 230. I do think though, that if we want a healthy, strong democracy, we should be able to argue and debate till we turn blue in the face, but we shouldn't be served totally different versions of paid speech from politicians that we don't even know that you and I are seeing different versions. So we can't then come together around the whatever is the version of the water cooler these days and discuss and debate our ideas for the best solution. So no, I don't think political ads is the most important, but it is what I was hired to lead there. That is just one example. I, I think it's really critical though to understand that these are intentional business decisions there. I, I agree with what Clint Watts said that on your, I think it might've been your very first panel, right? He, he and others have said this as well. I don't think it's the government's job, not just the, the government, it's no, it shouldn't be somebody's job to play never ending whack-a-mole, figure out every single thing that someone posts. Is it true? Is it false? What, I mean, never ending content moderation of every single person on the platform is just a losing battle. It is, however, and more important to figure out, I mean, I'll get to my ideas on Section 230 if you ask me, that's a whole nother conversation, but it's more important to understand, first of all, first and foremost, these companies are private companies, right? They're not the government. I think we also have a real messed up thing when we conflate First Amendment with what Facebook does. Great point. But just to be really clear, but the things that are still happening at the platform. I mean, I've always said, one of the things I've talked about for years is this idea of frictionless virality, right? It's the idea that everything should be able to be fast, first and free and should have the right to just without friction, which a few of your previous panelists have talked about, be blasted to however many people the algorithms decide to boost it to, or if you have coordinated behavior, however it is that certain messages are getting boosted well beyond what that one individual would have ever said, those are the tools that are really harmful to democracy. So I would love to attack the idea of frictionless reality. I mean, I know some companies are starting to, Twitter's coming up with all sorts of different tests of 
how to, I mean, even just today, I got a different pop-up today when I tried to share some um, news article on Twitter. And it was the first time I saw this one. And it was one of those makes you slow down. It says, I'm like, you haven't clicked on this link. Did you even read the piece? Oh, you, you didn't, didn't say it that, that way. I've, that's pretty commonplace for me. Well, they it's had, no, it was a little different. Day, saying I see that all the time. Me too. It's a little different. In the, in the previous experiment, it was just that you, you had to write something. It said, do you want to comment? This one was something a little bit, it was a new version, so I might be saying it wrong. But anyway, that's all friction. Yeah. Yes, I would love to see the data someday of whether or not that actually had an impact. I suspect it really does. But the biggest, I want to give one overarching statement here. I think listening to all the panels today, what frustrated me the most is there are always examples of all the good social media is doing. I agree with that. I've never, I'm not one of those burn it all down people. Or there's always a talking point, but if you touch content moderation in this way, or if you touch anything in that way via regulation, you're going to have these other consequences. All of that noise, I think, is intentional to also confuse us so that we don't ever do anything. You know, I was on this conversation yesterday. I don't want to take credit for someone, what someone else said, but I made this point of like, my God, everyone thinks we have to have the end all be all silver bullet, one piece of legislation that suddenly makes social media a lovely, healthy place for democracy. That's not going to happen. But we have lots of ideas. And this other person said, yeah, isn't it funny how technology can always go out and beta, like who cares how it affects the society, which I saw at Facebook. The first person to throw spaghetti at the wall was the first person whose idea got put out into the world and then we'll test it later. Whereas policy has to be perfect with zero unintended consequences and zero potential trade-offs before we can pass it. I think we yeah. can all agree right now, the status quo though, cannot continue. Yeah, I mean, so let's get to policy. Rick. Uh, I want to bring you in because, you know, you were a former undersecretary of state. You uh, were an editor at Time magazine. And then, in, uh, you know, you were a journalist, right? You were, you, you know, these journalists are, are the, 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 the staunchest sometimes defenders of, of free speech, you know, uh, without limit in a sense that it's a cornerstone of democracy. Then in 2019, I think these two roles that you played as Under Secretary of State and as a journalist kind of came to a head and you wrote this provocative op-ed in the Washington Post in which you kind of took on a third rail of American politics by suggesting that we might need limits to the First Amendment. In particular, you argued why America, America needs a hate speech law. So tell us, why does America need a hate speech law? Uh, you gave a little bit of my bio. I remember when I was a journalist, I felt I didn't know very much and I tried to be as controversial as possible. And when I was in government, I knew a whole lot and I tried to be as little controversial as possible. Um, I'm, I'm somewhere in between now. Um, why I think America needs a hate speech law. I'm not sure it does. What I think America needs is, is a hate speech debate. Um, you know, you've been talking about a lot of this all day. I think people don't quite understand uh, the First Amendment. It's not an unqualified right, the right to free speech. There are many examples of speech that is not protected. False advertising, violations of copyright, uh, child pornography, all of these things are not protected. And by the way, Facebook has thousands and thousands of people that take those things off because they are violations um, of the law. I would argue that in this marketplace of ideas model, which you've mentioned and we'll talk more about, uh, that hate speech is not an idea. Um, you know, the, the great dis Holmes discussion of the marketplace of ideas is, is about, you know, as he famously said, you know, the First Amendment is not to protect the ideas that we love, but the ideas that we hate. Well, that's not hate speech. Hate speech is not an idea. It's an epithet, it's an insult. It's much closer to obscenity, uh, which is not protected speech. So, so my whole argument is that, you know, again, to quote Holmes, you know, the, uh, the constitution is an experiment. We need to experiment with speech laws. Uh, uh, local communities can pass uh, an ordinance against hate speech. States can. It can then be adjudicated in the courts. It can go all the way up to the Supreme Court. We should have that debate. You know, what I find ironic is that the, the, the most zealous uh, people on the right who are defenders of, of uh, 
of the First Amendment and freedom of speech, they'll defend any kind of speech possible, including hate speech, except speech that criticizes the First Amendment. That should not be allowed. Yeah, no, I, I love it. I, I think, you know, one thing I really uh, appreciated about your article and about a lot of different things that I've seen you write is that you make this distinction about, and, and Jeff alluded to this earlier as well, about when these laws were written and the time we live in today. That essentially, I think part of your argument is that, you know, a lot of the laws that we're talking about were crafted and interpreted by courts in a different time. And that, you know, today in the age of social media, what specifically makes the marketplace of ideas more vulnerable uh, to manipulation is what Yael was speaking to. It's the specific technological structures and, and, uh, and, and processes that change the nature of our experience of speech and coordination and of action in such a way that the laws that were written when those things didn't exist aren't really applying in the same way. I mean, so let me ask you this though. Uh, Yael said, you know, she doesn't want, she doesn't know where the line is. And she said, nobody knows where the line is. And I, I agree with her. I think that line, when I've been on panels and people have asked me to think about that line, my go-to answer, Yael, I don't know if you want to steal this, is I, I, I can point to existence proofs on that side of the line uh, that prove there should be a line. And that's all I know, you know, like that, that's about as far as I can go. But let me, let me push you on that a little bit, Rick, which is to say, which types of, of speech should hate speech laws curtail? Is it misinformation? Is it incitements to violence? You know, what, what, what is the, what is the type of speech that we're so, that, that is the most important to think about in terms of hate speech laws? Well, I I mean, there are speeches that are, that is that are already prescribed. I mean, uh, Brandenburg versus Ohio in 1969 is the standard. By the way, you can cry cry fire in a crowded theater. What you cannot do, according to Brandenburg, is to is is speech that will incite imminent lawless action. That's the standard. I found it so strange that Trump's defender in in uh, his second impeachment hearing used Brandenburg to defend Trump's remarks. You could use it exactly the opposite, that he was inciting uh, imminent lawless action. Um, I actually, it's a hard problem, but I don't think it's an impossible problem. You mentioned that I was a, spent most of my career as a journalist. I mean, to me, the way to one, you know, one size fits all way to get there is to reform section 230 and give the platforms more liability like I had when I was editor of Time Magazine. I couldn't print disinformation. I couldn't print hate speech. I couldn't uh, print uh, imminent uh, speech that, that incited imminent lawless action. I was liable for that, right? They, they have to be more liable for the content that they publish. This idea that they're not publishers is laughable. I mean, they're the biggest publishers in the history of civilization. They just don't publish exclusively professional journalists who are who are creating content who actually abide by by those laws. So I think one of the, the the one size fits all solution is I don't think government should be regulating speech. That's what the First Amendment is about. Remember, it, it applies exclusively to government. Congress shall make no law. Those are the first five words of, of the First Amendment. Facebook can make any law it wants, but unless you give them more liability, uh, they won't take content down. And by the way, they're allowed to. Any private company is allowed to. They could decide if they want I'm ne no more adverbs on Facebook for the rest of time. That would be fine. And it might even be a good thing too, but they're allowed to do that. So, so I want to I want to go to uh, Renee because I think we have uh, we have really been um, dancing around a topic that that you have been so eloquent on. So you've been a leader in disinformation research and tech policy. You were at New Knowledge. Now you're at Stanford. You know, one set of writings uh, that particularly caught my eye was your keen take on this difference between speech and reach. And um, Yael uh, referenced it earlier, the notion that while we should all have the right to free speech in today's modern social economy with these social platforms, speech is algorithmically amplified and surfaced uh, in search results in uneven ways. And you've written about how tamping down this algorithmic amplification might be a fruitful way of curbing misinformation. So I think this distinction between speech and reach is 
really core to our discussion when we apply these very old concepts of speech regulation to modern experiences of speech in the digital public sphere. So can you describe what you mean by when you say free speech is not the same as free reach? And, and what role do you think recommendation algorithms play in mediating the conveyance of speech in the digital sphere today that we need to be thinking about? Sure. So I think I, uh, I was drafting, I wrote that in 2018. Right. <laughs> it feels very quaint today. Um, so the reason, though, was we saw a, an evolution in infrastructure, right? So social media reduced barriers, first for creation of content and then for dissemination of content. So you can think of that in two different phases, right? So first you produce your speech, then you disseminate it. And then on the creation front, we had already seen the blogosphere, for example, significantly reduce barriers to curation, but that was still largely decentralized. It was very hard to find things. Where social platforms really came into play was you had this standing audience, you know, millions of people. You had networks, you know, so information could traverse more easily. It wasn't like nobody seeing your, you know, your random blog on GeoCities. And so there were affordances that were built for dissemination, the like button, the share button, various means by which ordinary people could participate in um, helping information travel. And in the early days, that was still largely uh, controlled within the means of a re reverse chronological feed. Um, there were certain structures that still uh, limited that distribution to some extent. But what began to happen was that as more and more people created content, there became this glut of content. And so the role of algorithmic curators, of which recommendations are actually only one type, really began to shape what people saw and particularly to filter it in certain ways to incentivize them to either stay on the platform or engage in a particular way. And so what you started to see was that um, there was this third phase then. So there was creation, there was dissemination, sort of deliberate user uh, engagement around it. And then there was inadvertent algorithmic amplification. So we move from affordances then to algorithms, right, where the system is actually taking an active part in deciding what you see and what is going to spread. So when we were looking at this back in 2018, we were saying that really the other troubling thing about it was that that algorithmic reach piece was actually gameable. You know, using bots, which was like a thing that people did from 2015 to 2017 or so, you could actually kind of fool the algorithmic curation. So wild stuff that, you know, would start to trend that was not actually reflective of real, uh, you know, authentic engagement with content. Instead, you would see this inadvertent uh, algorithmic amplification of ideas. Um, I love Sam Woolley's term for it at the time was manufacturing consensus, right? Again, the idea that you had this democratized process, you had this momentum function that was moving information along, but it wasn't really indicative or reflective of actual underlying speech. It was instead amplifying signals uh, in, a, in such a way as, as to you know, tell you there, when in reality, it was oftentimes just straight up manipulation. So I think there's always been this, you know, this... Um, a division between your right to speak and your right to have a megaphone that reached, you know, hundreds of millions of people. There, there was never that massive reach was never encompassed in your right to freedom of speech. And so as we were looking at this dynamic of distribution, dissemination, algorithmic curation, and recommendation engines, one of the ways in which this manifested quite tangibly for me was in 2019 looking at the content from the anti-vaccine movement, which is now a subject of you know, a national debate as we're trying to figure out how to vaccinate a population against a global pandemic. But in 2019, very quaintly, this was the MMR vaccine, which is not new. It was not a, you know, an, an unknown thing that no one knew about. It was actually, in fact, manipulative groups that were trying to repeatedly advance this idea that the MMR was harmful, that it caused various diseases and that children shouldn't get it. And the net effect of this was a rise in the real world of this preventable disease. And so the thing that was remarkable to me about that was ways in which this the recommendation engine was actively pushing anti-vaccine content to people. Did you engage with it once? Well, here, you might like it again. Are you in a crunchy mom group? Here's this anti-vaccine group you might like. And then from there, it went to QAnon and then to Pizzagate. And there were so many different conspiracy theories that the recommendation engine was pushing that for me, it felt like a very simple thing to say, like, maybe this isn't ideal. Maybe we are not curating in the best possible way. This is <laughs> maybe we could do it better. Maybe there are certain things we shouldn't amplify. And maybe we allow them to stay on the platform because you do have a First Amendment right or a freedom of expression, I think perhaps is more appropriate than First Amendment here. But if, if a freedom of expression, um, there's, there's value to you being able to express your anti-vaccine views. 
but the platform doesn't necessarily need to boost it. It doesn't need to serve it. And that's where I felt that there was this, this opportunity to kind of demarcate like between the two and say, maybe this stuff stays on the platform, maybe it doesn't come down, but perhaps it's not algorithmically amplified. And this is a concept that search engines had really come to actually back in 2012 with the idea that, you know, Google's your money or your life um, uh, policy framework that said, for things related to health or finances, there should be a higher standard of care and what's returned. It shouldn't just be whatever has the most backlinks or whatever has, you know, the best SEO. It should, in fact, be returning reputable information. And perhaps we could incorporate some of that into the curation dynamics that we were seeing on social media as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I actually wrote a lot about vaccines in my book, and some people don't know this, but we eradicated measles in the United States in the year 2000. In 2010, there were 63 cases of measles in the U.S., and in 2019, there were 1,250 cases in just the first six months, and they were concentrated in places like Rockland County, New York, and Clark County, Washington. And if you compare the data on Facebook ad buys for anti-vaccine content with disease outbreaks of measles, you see that it was targeted at exactly these tight-knit communities where, uh, where you saw the, the, the disease outbreaks. And, you know, I wrote the book before the coronavirus pandemic, but wow, how essential is uh, this debate now? We saw, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Dodger Stadium uh, being shut down in Los Angeles as a vaccine site. Um, and this is a problem we didn't really have uh, in the year 2000 and 2001 and 2002, but what you're, so this distinction between speech and reach, between algorithmic amplification, the serving through recommendations and so on versus the speech act itself. And you say, there's a better way that we could do this. So what's the better way? What can we think about in terms of platform policies concerning, you know, feed search recommendation algorithms that would promote speech while cur cur curtailing harmful speech? So I think that there's roughly, you know, kind of three buckets of interventions, if you will. There is um, education, and I think other speakers in the conference have addressed the concept of demand, right? And there was a CDA 230 specific conference that was happening in the National Academies today, where again, that question of demand, what do you do about demand? Um, and because one of the reasons that this stuff is served is because there is demand for it, and it becomes sort of a self-fulfilling, uh, you know, loop at some point. And so I think that you have some um, educational components to engage with people about these, you know, the, the types of topics that we've been discussing. Then you have the policy where I feel like, you know, my, my personal um, area, I, I think I still do believe in self-regulatory means. And, and <laughs> I feel like that's, you know, um, maybe I'm uh, one of the fewer, but I, I believe that there's a role for regulation in terms of oversight, but also in terms of the ability to craft nimble responses. I think that policy and more, more specifically design actually, um, that design the types of friction, uh, you know, methodologies for introducing friction that you were discussing, I think is actually a really key one. Um, myself and Tobias Rose Stockwell put out some suggestions in Wired on that recently, just trying to say that there are opportunities to use design because it, it can uh, be a little bit more, nimble. So one of the ways that you might um, use design to think through reach or the, you know, that that kind of pop up that Twitter has, would you like to, uh, would you like to engage with this content before sharing it? Uh, maybe the share button is grayed out for a period of time until you've, you know, actually, if you click through and visited the URL. Um, I think there's a lot of interesting thinking from, um, from, you know, folks like Dan Kahneman, uh, ironically, thinking fast and slow, right? Um, are there nudges that can push people towards a more reflective model of sharing? And are there ways to, uh, to kind of think through reach from a demand uh, standpoint, from a user action standpoint, so that it doesn't feel quite so, like, so much like censorship, where, which is reactive and trying to moderate the content as it's going viral. But on that front too, there are real opportunities. And we saw this play out time and time again during the election, where something would go viral and there are opportunities, I think, for the platforms to use temporary throttling to get the fact checkers you know, on it earlier. So that rather than trying to constantly moderate after the fact or correct the record after the fact or take something down after the fact, there are ways to build that, that process of, uh, of, of assessing content as it's beginning to go viral and, and beginning to, to think about um, where are those points of intervention in the earlier phase of it as opposed to uh, after it's achieved millions and millions of you know, views on YouTube. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, this notion of friction, I think, is one that we've talked about uh, earlier today. But also, I just want to point out again, uh, this great uh, uh, research paper that was published recently by my colleagues, David Rand and Dean Eccles and their team uh, here at the MIT IDE that shows that uh, accuracy nudges, that if you just nudge people to be reflective about the accuracy of what they are reading, uh, reduce the belief in and the sharing of false news, uh, that's an example of a Danny Kahneman style intervention that would sort of nudge people uh, towards reflectivity, it would add friction and so on uh, in the mix. I want to turn a little bit to uh, audience questions and see if I can't bring some of those in. Um, uh, this one I'm going to direct at Yael, uh, having worked at Facebook um, and thought about what kind of solutions uh, might might work. Would it be reasonable? This is a this is a question from the audience. Would it be reasonable to require labels on posted material? opinion, satire, consensus, alt, original. And if the material was not labeled, then it would, uh, if it wasn't labeled by the author, it wouldn't be carried uh, by the platform or uh, the platform would automatically label it. Does labeling help? Is labeling uh, part of the solution here? We'll go to Yael first and then other people, if they have thoughts, please jump in. So, I mean, I guess it depends on what you mean by labeling. I know there's been studies about different kinds of labeling and whether they work or not. Um, to me, it still doesn't address the core problem, but it, it, in its, it, sure, I think better labeling is a thing that could be helpful if it was, it, it's first and foremost, it's not actually scalable at the same rate that Facebook is operating right now, right? So there's that problem. And if you wanted to actually label something before hundreds or thousands or millions of people see it, then you've got to build in friction before that post even goes up. That's another problem. Like things might not get, things don't even make it to fact checkers until after how many people have already seen it. So I'm not saying that's not a possibility. It, it, it could be, but um, I don't know if it addresses really the core issue. I think it's one interesting intervention. The core um, issue is, is what, in your opinion? Sorry, I didn't hear the lesson. Sorry, the core issue. It doesn't address the core issue. What's the core issue? The core issue for me, it doesn't, it, there's lots of issues. <laughs> the core issue uh, that makes me obviously very passionate about this is all of these different ideas, they all still are either putting a lot of the responsibility on the user and it doesn't think about who all those users are. So does that mean if someone who's not technically sophisticated, do they have the right to be manipulated because they didn't figure out how to use this middleware that people are proposing or, or these other ideas? Um, or the most vulnerable who are actually really silenced, their speech is just not as important as the speech of somebody who Let's be honest, why did they never want to fact check Donald Trump, especially in paid advertising even, because he had the power to regulate them or to really make their lives difficult. It was a political decision. I, I, I think one of the really interesting things though is this. Again, no accountability exists right now for this industry, which I can never accept that to this day, we still think they should be 100% hands off. I also wonder though, it seems to me that, and, and, I mean, Jeff, I'm curious to hear his thoughts on this too, that it's not even necessarily about is section 230 so bad, right? <laughs> Perhaps there's some updated language, but are our courts way over interpreting them because, or way over interpreting section 230 to give Facebook a free pass on everything, not just on the speech it's hosting, but on intentional design decisions, on targeting practices, on all sorts of other things, on whether or not they're connecting a predator to a child. Like there's so many other things that it seems like the courts may be over-interpreting. Um, I'm gonna, just in case it doesn't come back to me, can I say one quick thing that's not related to that question? I, I think right now, the more so more and more we're hearing people like Nick Clegg who you spoke to speak or or even a lot of the different critics are starting to actually undermine other critics which means that this conversation is starting to get to the point of oh wow something's actually going to be done I really believe that's why there's so much noise but 
when you have someone like Nick Clegg say, I really want to engage with critics, which is what he said after he wrote that long medium post. And then he went on to Casey Newton's podcast. And then he interviewed with you. He has never engaged with any of the critics. He only will do one-on-one -on -one curated conversations. I mean, Facebook, if you look at BuzzFeed's article today, there's where there was an article a few hours ago about an internal like review of the January 6th situation. And there's a quote in there that actually says only after the violence of January 6th did the teams realize they were dealing with a movement that normalized delegitimization and hate in a way that resulted in offline harm. Hmm. Are you kidding me? I mean, all of us have been saying for so long and they only realized it after January 6th. All I'm going to say, and then I will stop, is we talk about speech and all the things the platforms could do and all the different design choices. I agree with all of those, but none of that should replace the fact that if they aid and abet a crime, if they do not have a duty of care for, our, for us, if they are not acting as legal and good stewards of democracy, there should be mechanisms to hold them accountable. So Jeff, I want to ask you to answer Yael's question: Are the courts uh, uh, over-interpreting or under-interpreting uh, Section 230 in order to give uh, the platforms too much of a pass? And I'm going to tack on a question from the audience, which is: You know, since Facebook has an algorithm that boosts or doesn't boost content, doesn't isn't that itself moderation? Shouldn't that qualify as moderation? Just because a human sure. doesn't do it. Yeah, so I mean, I, I think that's a really important question. I think it's also um, a little difficult to answer with certainty because when you talk about over-interpreting it, it's what using what is the baseline, I guess, is what I would ask. Uh, there's very uh, there, there's a very narrow way to read Section 230 that basically would have said that it only applies uh, that it basically creates the distributor standard of liability for all platforms. So if they know or have reason to know of the defamatory or illegal content, they're liable. Um, that would have been a reasonable way to read it. Uh, the first case to interpret Section 230 in the Fourth Circuit by Judge Wilkinson rejected that uh, premise. Uh, Judge Wilkinson's a former newspaper editor, very much sort of a free speech uh, streak in his opinions. And he took this very broad view that said, uh, unless an exception applies or the platform took part in the content creation, there's no liability. And basically that has gone unchallenged until actually last year with the statement that Justice Thomas issued just for himself. Uh, but lower courts have basically uniformly adopted the very broad reading. Under that very broad reading of section 230, I think there, I, most most of the immunity has been correctly given. Now, whether it just on, on that interpretation, I think there are some cases where um, platforms have been uh, received protection uh, when they should not have either because they've created the content or the claim is not actually treating them as a publisher, but is related to sort of activities outside of publishing. I think. The algorithmic question is a really interesting one. And there are a few cases that are currently going through the courts right now um, where I would expect within a few months, we're gonna have some interesting rulings. And I wouldn't be surprised if we see some rejections of um, section 230 protection for some, some of these instances where it's not really related to the platform's publishing of someone else's speech, but it's, but it's actions in, um, in, in how it handles that content. Uh, so I don't, I, but, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I think there are, there are, and I, I wish I had more time to go into sort of specific troubling instances, but it has been interpreted very broadly. And I, I think that um, the, the question is, how do you, uh, it's a really fascinating question, is how do you change 230 to sort of protect the core speech that it's enabled while going after these outlier cases. And I think there's some interesting uh, proposals for that, but it, it's tough because the platforms will react in a very risk averse way. And I'm not talking about Facebook as much as I'm talking about sort of the midsize and smaller platforms. So I, I'm, I, I think there's a lot of issues to unpack there.
So one of the one of the downsides of being the host of this is that uh, while you're busy moderating all these panels, you miss the news. And Renee messaged me and Yael mentioned that Craig Silverman at BuzzFeed broke something on the Stop the Steal groups about an hour ago, leaked internal documents. Somebody want to fill me in on that? I have no idea what you're talking about, but I'd love to hear it. Seems relevant. Renee. Sure. Yeah, I am. Um, my this is a full panel window for me right now, so I was actually trying to see if I could uh, <laughs> pull find up, it. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, no. Um, there was an interesting, basically, during the election um, and immediately following the election in particular, there were a number of groups that grew quite rapidly on Facebook. There was one in particular that our team at Election Integrity Partnership saw as well. It was called Stop the Steal. Um, this was a hashtag that had predated the election. It actually dated way back to a phrase that Roger Stone used. It was used again by Stone and affiliated activists um, to frame the conversation about the impending theft of the election. So several months before the election, they began to lay the groundwork claiming that this was going to be a stolen election. So this was not a new meme. This had actually had quite, you know, quite a ramp up. But of course, it really explodes right after the election, particularly on election night. Um, you know, Trump made that statement articulating that he felt that the election had been stolen from him when Fox News, I believe it was, called uh, Arizona for Biden. So that was the, the, the kind of space in which this happened. So then by the next morning, or maybe about maybe 24 hours, 36 hours later, there was a Facebook group with several hundred thousand people in it, upwards of 300,000 people. And the group came down very, very suddenly. And those of us who had been watching from outside were kind of curious about whether it had come down for incitement because there were some violent posts in there, um, or if it had come down for something else, for election misinformation, you know, the transparency wasn't quite there. So this this story that, that Craig broke in, in BuzzFeed um, shortly before, right before this panel started, was actually a leaked internal document in which the people in Facebook are doing the kind of post-mortem investigating this group and the takedown and their uh, sort of failure in some ways to envision the full scope of, um, of what happened. There had been a lot of red teaming and gaming out what would happen on election day, what would happen in the event of a disputed election, what would happen if there was Russian interference in an election, what would happen if there was you know, a whole variety of, uh, of things. But the violence, the kind of perception of violence had really been limited to violence on election night. So this, this subsequent two month ramp up where uh, between November and January 6th really continued to grow and these groups continued to grow and even kind of tamping them down. It was like playing whack-a-mole. So what this report says is because we were looking at each identity individually rather than as a cohesive movement, we were only able to take down individual groups and pages after they exceeded a violation threshold. So what Facebook is effectively saying that what the analysts who did this work are saying is that they took down in a very whack-a-mole kind of way when a particular group would, it, would reach a threshold for incitement or some such that justified the takedown of that group. But they did not treat the movement holistically and they had over-focused on coordinated inauthentic behavior which is that term that we all know that refers to, you know, uh, state-sponsored interference or astroturfing. Sometimes now it, it is beginning to have more and more kind of domestic components to it. But they did not necessarily think about this in terms of a sudden cohesive mass movement, a sudden uh, iteration of networked activism that had as part of its core component a much, much higher threshold of calls for incitement uh, and calls for violence than in their uh, you see in this uh, in this in the BuzzFeed article, and I don't have it up in front of me, but there's a little table, and it has that there's um, you know X percent more of the following types of speech that the platform deems harmful: incitement to violence, dehumanization, you know, various types of language, um, and they they have kind of like a three table comparison showing their average group, the um, what they call I think the Patriot Party group, which maybe is encompassing a couple different things, uh, and then the stop the steal groups. And so you can see their relative thresholds and what helps them make this decision. But ultimately what it comes down to is, even though everyone had articulated, or everyone in the research community already had, had articulated that this was going to be a much more domestic focused thing, and that we had seen this ramp up, we had seen prior to the election, the, uh, the allegations of fraud laying the groundwork for destabilization and delegitimization, that didn't translate to them necessarily making that leap uh, internally or having a policy framework that allowed them to take into account the kinds of dynamics that were taking shape. 
So uh, this is fascinating. I'm just hearing about it from, from the just now for the first time. But let me just say that this harkens back to something that Clint Watts said in the very first panel, where he said, actually, we just have a small number of nefarious actors that if we just went after the guns and stopped trying to catch the bullets, uh, that we could succeed. But what this says is, no, it's really, you got to think holistically about the many different bubblings up that together are creating movements of information that are potentially dangerous. And the thing that I know that's interesting about this is that Facebook is extremely well versed in understanding interdependencies between information movements. They have entire teams of statisticians that understand the interdependent data concept and how you can track multiple things moving simultaneously. That's what a network is. Their whole science is built on that. That's a fascinating tie back to the panel we had in the morning uh, uh, with Clint Watts about misinformation. I got one last question and it's for Rick, which is that Rick, you wrote this fantastic book called Information Wars where you were looking at the misinformation around uh, the 2016 election. My question to you is, uh, will the platforms deal with this on their own? Do we need the, go the government to step in and create incentives for them to harden our democracy to threats that come through their channels? Uh, the very, very short answer to that is yes. Um, I do think we have to define our terms at where you're at the end of your day. I mean, disinformation is false information deliberately used to deceive you. Misinformation is information that's wrong, but it may not be deliberate, maybe a mistake. That is actually protected speech. And to kind of uh, try to dovetail this with the last uh, question and, and, and talking about Facebook, one of the one of my jobs when I was undersecretary was to combat uh, ISIS disinformation and ISIS propaganda. We worked very closely with Facebook, uh, with YouTube, um, all of these platforms. When it came to extremist speech like that, they got energized, and and because there was no uh, subjectivity about it for the most part, they hired hundreds and thousands of Arabic speakers. Uh, they did a very good job of taking that kind of content down. By the way, as they do a good job of taking content down, uh, which involves child pornography, uh, they're good at that. They, they are able to do these things. They need to be incentivized to do them. I think government regulation has to incentivize them to do it. And I, I would argue that they actually want to be regulated more because they don't like being in that gray area of, of subjective decisions. They want to be able to be able to say, well, the government made me do this. Thank you all so much. This was such an important and productive conversation. I know you are all incredibly busy. I sincerely appreciate you taking the time uh, to have this conversation with us. I very much look forward to a time in the near future where we can also get the hugs and high fives that go along with these conversations instead of just the, the virtual piece of it. Um, looking forward to seeing you all in person. Uh, thank you very much uh, for, for being on this panel. Uh, I just want to transition uh, to uh, the close of the conference. We've come to the end. Uh, nobody wants to hear me talk anymore, so I'm going to keep this incredibly short. I just want to thank everybody for joining and thank all of our participants for participating and for contributing so many amazing ideas. And I want to just draw one uh, sort of theme uh, throughout, which is how interdependent all of these topics are, from competition to the incentives to change, to the regulation of speech, to how do we stop misinformation. No one of these spheres can be tackled on its own. In my book, I talk about four levers, uh, money, code, norms, and laws, where money is the business model, code is the designs of the platforms, the algorithms, norms are how we adopt and use them, and laws are the regulation. I think I'm becoming more and more convinced that we have to have all of these oars rowing in the same direction, and that there's no silver bullet, there's no one law, there's no one policy change, but that we have to make a concerted effort 
to do many things at once to start moving in the right direction. I am an optimist, so I firmly believe that we can, but I'm also a realist, and I think that we need much more input from experts like the ones that you saw today uh, in this conversation. That's why I've called for a national commission on democracy and technology. And so uh, just to close and just to go out, it's been a long day. I'm not going to talk much longer. I just want to say it's worth participating in this conversation. Join us for more conversations at MIT. Write to your congressmen and women and demand more action. Call for a National Commission on Democracy and Technology. Get involved in these conversations wherever they're happening and slowly and slowly, step by step, we'll make the concerted efforts that are needed to make inroads into these problems. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank you to the IDE for their support, to MIT more broadly as an institute for supporting the IDE, to all of our sponsors and channel partners for all of their efforts around this specific event, all of our panelists and to the audience uh, for all of your fantastic questions and for listening for so long. Thank you very much.